and welcome to the latest episode of the Be Better podcast. And with me today, I have Dave Rouse from Carbon Click. So good day today. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Thanks. You're dialing in from sunny Auckland, is it? <laughs> That's right. It is sunny today, which we're lucky. Um, we've had a great autumn so far and the, long may that continue. The winterless north, as they <laughs> allegedly like us to believe, but we know it's all a ruse. Um so yeah, so for people who don't know who Dave Rouse is and maybe what Carbon Click is, who are you? What do you do? Give us a give us a brief intro. Yeah, so I guess my background has been in uh, building businesses uh, with a philanthropic spin to it, triple bottom line, and now quadruple bottom line profitability um, has always been a big part of my life. Never um, until Carbon Click have I had the opportunity to be part of the B Corp. Um, Fano and Carbon Click is a climate tech startup from based here in New Zealand that's uh, got a fairly global reach. And what we do is connect good businesses that are on a strong decarbonisation journey with um, and their consumers with carbon offsets that are of high integrity um, native reforestation type projects that will enhance the net zero. Uh, journey that those businesses are on and give their consumers an engaging way to participate and do something extra while they're um, purchasing uh, as responsibly as they can. Nice. And so how did you get into that? Um, I was angel investing for probably the last nine or 10 years. And this was a an opportunity that came up in the um, early, early stages. They the co-founders alongside me were um, working for an international airline and had built the carbon offsetting platform and decided there was a better way to do things that could be far more impactful and create more tangible benefits to the environment and be more engaging for the individuals that were clicking the little green button when they uh, wanted to offset their flights. And at the start, you know, I, I wanted to back the guys. I loved them, um, loved what they stood for but they didn't have a good commercial uh, person on board. So I sort of stuck my hand up and said, let's make this happen. I'll, I'll jump in with you if you want. And, um, and we'll take this to the market, build the product and see what happens. So that's where we are. Um, almost four years on from first registering the business and starting that tech build process, um, coming through COVID and all the rest of it. Yep. We, we broadened our horizons significantly through that period as online uh, retail shopping increased considerably and airlines vanished considerably over that period. So now we've sort of come through the tail end of it and we're focusing on a number of different areas. One is the travel sector, including travel to and from events. So um, events ticketing platforms can um, allow consumers when they're traveling to and from those events to uh, offset that. And we also offset big major events like we offset FIFA World Cup last year and so on. Um, and we were able to redirect those offsetting funds into far more meaningful and tangible projects than what they were earmarked for. So we're pretty proud of um, the benefits that we're able to yeah. bring in that space. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, because I think the last time I was sort of talking to Jan, a couple of, well, it's it, for like a, a, an in depth conversation was probably before COVID. Um, so Jan is one of your co founders. And yeah, you, you were very much focused on that airline market and i guess yeah covid <laughs> will make that challenging um as you said um so four years ago so what's that well, 2023 so kind of 2018 2019 so carbon i suppose was was on the radar then um but possibly not as big on the radar as it is now so what timing wise yeah how, how have you seen yeah, I mean, I saw, I saw the timing as being, as being a perfect timing to go early into the markets. Obviously, COVID had a massive impact on uh, on all of our early plans, but we certainly, you know, aside from COVID, it was the right time. Greta Thunberg was bringing in the, you know, the flug scum, the flight shaming movement, um, and having the strikes, school strikes for climate. And so on uh, around that time, it was it was really getting airtime and gaining rapid momentum. Uh, businesses were faced with this new term called social license to operate that was being forced upon them and boards were struggling to understand what that means and, and what the threat was to their businesses if they didn't address it. So it was all a, a rapid learning curve. A lot of it was also to do with the maturity of the scientific data around climate change as well. So 
back then the AR5, um, which is the IPCC report at the time, had some major challenges with it um, that were subject to criticism and uh, and deeper interrogation. So you had the Donald Trumps of the world who were saying, well, hang on, this, some of this data doesn't make sense to some of these scientists. And so climate change is a hoax. So, and they were right that some of the data didn't make sense, but they were leveraging that heavily. And at the time, I remember not, not being sure about what side of the fence to sit on. Uh, with regards to the climate change debate, because I didn't know the facts. I thought the biggest problem in the world was single-use plastics back then, and that was mm. my mission to um, to tackle. But I read the IPCC report end-to-end, -end, the 1,500-page sort of version. Wow. It took me a year. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a bed, I, like bedtime reading. Yeah, page one took me three hours to read uh, because I was having to um google the acronyms and then go down rabbit mm. hole with just about every line but by the time i got to the end of it i was really comfortable with understanding where the data discrepancies were and things like you know in some parts of the world they measure mean sea level temperature as the temperature of the actual surface of the water in some countries they measure it as um, a meter above the water of the air temperature above sea level so you get data which sometimes would show that the temperature hadn't changed but it was just things like measurements being done yep. differently and once you understood that and could unpick those arguments that were coming from the you know Trump scientists of the world and and see the document as a whole not just as individual pockets it was quite easy to see that we had a huge problem and a huge challenge ahead of us and you can't unlearn this stuff once you've gone deep into the science um and you know I don't know if you, you know, you're a good Canterbury boy. You've probably been to Fox Glacier and Franz Joseph Glacier yep. a few times in your life. And and if you've compared those photos from, you know, childhood to what they are now and seen, hey, this this is very real retreat and it's consistent. Um, and combine that with the messages from Sir David Attenborough and, you know, some of my other heroes around look at the consistent um, trends of polar ice caps and so on. Of course, when polar ice caps melt, that doesn't, if they're floating, that doesn't displace um, or change the displacement in the seawater. So sea levels don't rise, but it's an early signal of what happens as the land melt occurs, yep. permafrost occurs and so on, um, where you really start to see that acceleration of sea level rising, which we've, we're have we staring down the barrel of um, an extreme weather uh, con considerably increasing uh, over the next 30, 40 years. That's... Uh, that's the sort of thing that really drove me to say, well, hang on, what am I going to be proud of when I'm sitting on my deathbed? Um, hopefully in a, in a very long time. Um, <laughs> and and this was one of those opportunities to leverage the knowledge that I had to, um, uh, I guess, myth bust those that were out there um, denying and spreading false news, but also to leverage the good um, and really double down on you know, even in the carbon offsetting world, there are bad projects yep. um, that are just an accounting exercise. And, you know, I'm pretty heavily lobbying against um, some of the standards that include them as as valid carbon offsets. But that's that's where I saw my calling, the ability to leverage that to drive impact at scale um, through the carbon offsetting piece. And a lot of the time being the tail that wags the dog. So organizations that say, hey, we want to go you know, to net zero and we want to offset our emissions and we want to do it responsibly. It's an opportunity sometimes to say, hey, you guys are not quite ready because you're not on a strong enough decarbonization journey. You're going to get accused of greenwashing, even though your intentions are good. You've got a, a bit of learning to do there and, um, and it's not going to come across right if you don't get that balance right of decarbonization first. So... Mm. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, mate. Um, I, I would imagine you're possibly uh, like number of people that have actually read the full IPCC report. I'm I'm thinking it's probably not in the thousands, maybe. No, and this surprised <laughs> me. Even a lot of the authors and contributors hadn't read the full report. Full report. They've read yeah, their section. They'll, they'll read their bit. Expert on their section, but they're not seeing. A lot of them are not seeing the whole end to end. Yeah, um, big picture, which which did really surprise me. So we we also had you know some arguments when I sat on some of the um, observation panels. Um, there were arguments between academics as well. 
because each of them hadn't read the other's um, right. yeah. uh, story, really. Yeah. And it, it's it's that classic, because um, I used to sell medical devices and it was, you know, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons. And I guess it's the same with academics. You know, if you, if you put 10, 10 orthopedic surgeons in the room, you'll have 20 opinions. Um, and it's possibly the same with academics, you know, talking themselves in and out of positions and round and round. Um, no, so kudos to you for reading that, because I think it's hard it's hard to know what to believe fully unless you've actually done the full work yourself and, and have internalized that and have done the research. So massive kudos to you because it, it does it does feel to a degree, I guess from a from a lay perspective to a degree, but obviously heavily involved in the world of B Corp and impact reporting and you know trying to make businesses better. It does feel like the last couple of years has just become the carbon offsetting Wild West. And there is now thousands of companies that are carbon something where it's like you pay us some money and we can make stuff go away. And then and then, you hear, you know, there's companies making claims around, yeah, well, we're carbon zero or we've offset our carbon. And it's like, well, what, what exactly have you offset and how have you offset it? Because are you you've offset your scope one emissions, which were zero. OK, so you've planted one tree. You're now carbon positive in your designation. So, yeah, thoughts thoughts on on this carbon wild west. Where, where are we at? It's yeah, it's certainly such a, a big challenge. And I think there are enough for the big organisations that attract enough attention. There are the journalists, there are the whistleblowers that catch them out, and yep. that you know that's self regulating. Excuse me. Bless you. The the challenge that we have is in the mid tier markets where uh, companies are not big enough to um, to attract the attention and be called out by consumer commission um, or you know the relevant watchdog authorities for greenwashing. And there's a lot of it that does yeah. go on. You you know you picked on the scope one emissions thing. We know in New Zealand roughly seventy five percent of all emissions are scope three. So yeah. most most businesses are. Uh, Count, if they're counting emissions, are counting scope one and two. Yep. Um, but we know we're, we're 25% of, the, of yeah. the emissions really are being offset in that business. If it's being tainted as green, they're encouraging consumers to move away from other brands that potentially were no worse or potentially were even better because it's it's a bit of a creative accounting exercise. It's like yep. you know coming to tax returns at the end of the year for IRD. Yeah. So the 101 crash course in, in scope one, two and three for people who don't know. So scope one is basically emissions from company owned facilities and company owned vehicles. Scope two are emissions from purchased power that runs your owned facilities. And then scope three is everything else. And pretty much, like you say, for most businesses, scope three is where most of your emissions lie. And I guess even for the B Corp assessment, um, realistically you you only get well under the current framework you get points recognition for tracking your scope one and two and they ask you questions about carbon intensity which is basically how much carbon do you emit per million dollars of revenue so scope three is not a compulsory measurement for b corp even at the minute so yeah i think there's a um there's an event coming up in sydney uh later in, the, in may or mid-may that i'm talking at um, and, and one of the other events or panels is called My Scope 3 is Your Scope 1. We need to talk. <laughs> and yeah. it does it does sort of feel like, yeah, creative accounting, Wild West. Um, yeah, absolutely. Do you include your flights or do you not? You know, there's some grey area uh, areas like that that can be really yeah. uh, creatively avoided or included, depending on how honest or... Um, yeah or you know technical a company wants yeah. to be and even even like the you know like the fifa events well it's, it's kind of like well yes it's me as the consumer or the ticket holder who has traveled there but i've had to travel to your venue because you can't bring your game so it's kind of like almost where does the you know where does it who does it lie with to to make changes i guess it's collectively but yeah it, it kind of um i guess the risk is it it it, it goes to people just kind of go what's well, not my problem you know that, that's on you instead of yeah what are your thoughts on yeah, that yeah everybody's keen to point the point the finger to somewhere else but in fact we all need to play our part if you're traveling to fifa you need to um you know we all want to live an enjoyable life 
Um, if you're traveling to FIFA in Qatar, for example, it was difficult because it's only really air travel that can get mm. you there. Um, you know, FIFA could probably make a mandate that they have to choose venues that at least 50% of their attendees can arrive by train, for example, would mm. make a big difference to that carbon yep. footprint. There is a responsibility on both parties, yep. but um, certainly in the in the Qatar case, they had some big problems, both humanitarian and environmental. I was, I was um, going to say, it, maybe the, the carbon emissions was, was sort of the least of the impact worries for, for the yeah, Qatar World Cup. Yeah, a number of challenges yeah. to, to unpack there. But, yeah. but certainly, you know, the silver lining is we were able to redirect $1.4 million of uh, that was destined for rubbish carbon offsets mm -hmm. into some really meaningful projects that make a big difference to not only the environment, but also the communities and the social impact. Yep. Um, around those those projects so, so that's, what's, what... that's where we try and you know understand yeah. the fact that there's a lot of bad happening and we we need to look through that and say what's the good that we can do right now what's the maximum impact we can have that changes the state of the planet yeah so what what specifically that is different about how you're doing your offsetting that is at a higher level or a higher benchmark compared to others who we, we won't name and shame, but you know. Yeah, ab absolutely. So the, the key thing is that we we run a secondary audit process over the carbon offsets. So first of all, um, we'll look for the type of carbon offsets that will resonate with our, con our customers and their consumers or their stakeholders. Um, often native reforestation is a really pro popular one. Um, but it's really expensive because the you know the growth in indigenous species is slower than a species like pine. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to recognise that in making sure that these people running these projects can actually do it affordably and sustainably themselves. And we know that it's not going to be as profitable for them as running a big pine forest. So we're all in this together. They're doing their part. We're supporting them as much as possible. But it does cost a lot more per tonne um, for native reforestation because you're getting less lower yields. But you're getting all of the biodiversity impact that goes with that. So we're working with the likes of WWF and have a look at where their projects are or where their, you know, where their albatrosses are, royal albatrosses are nesting, for example, and we'll pick projects on Banks Peninsula that reforest that and help with pest control and, and all that kind of thing. So that we're helping multiple outcomes from the carbon. Uh, spin-off we're making sure that that involves public access from the community so that community members can go and reconnect free of charge uh, with nature there which brings all the mental health benefits and so on and it's not becoming an elitist locked away uh, part of forest or anything like that um so so we look at first of all additionality how genuinely additional is the project and is it genuinely bringing emissions out of the atmosphere by putting money into it the next thing is permanence. So how long is it doing it for? And my example before with pine, you know, the, for every one degree in climate change, pine has a 700% higher likelihood of coming to forest fire. So right. the risk there is that 30 years time, yes, it's sequestered all of the carbon, but there's a high chance that it gets released back into the atmosphere. And this is the problem Microsoft faced, you know, best of intentions, but they lost a good chunk of their carbon stock uh, to forest fire. Uh, the next thing is biodiversity, which I've touched on. Um, what biodiversity values can we bring? And not all of the projects have a biodiversity value. Um, and then the fourth thing is a social impact. So what's the maximum amount of social impacts that can be created when we're comparing different projects? And sometimes it can be things like solar hot water in India, which is you know very cheap to put um, solar water heating on the roofs of all of the you know, hospitals, uh, apartment complexes and so on that reduce that power loading that's coming from coal and yep. Um, yep. But the social benefits that come from that as well is um, a lot of those communities are without power for a day at a time and and can't have refrigeration the food yep. goes off and so you get all the methane issues and waste issues and that sort of thing as well so there's there's all these co-benefits that go with it that are often not calculated in the carbon but have much wider uh, social impacts beyond that and then there's the unintended consequences which is kind of the least uh least talked about but often the biggest challenge and and we see a lot of that with for example the red plus projects um where there are avoided deforestation and some avoided deforestation is really good don't get mm. me wrong but um in a lot of cases we've found in the amazon 
for example, where we've done research, the owners of these projects or the you know ultimate beneficiaries of some of these carbon projects are the landowners that also own uh, soy, beef, palm, right. and so on. And and when you look at it, you identify the patterns where they're ring fencing steep, hilly, rocky areas um, that logically they wouldn't be able to farm very easily. Right. And they're calling that a carbon offset project and all the flat land is being bulldozed and burnt down. And so by funding them more, all they're doing is expanding their business activities and actually burning down more areas of the Amazon uh, for farming mm. and just re-fencing the pockets that they can't and claiming carbon credits on those. So that's that's something that I am pretty passionate about exposing um, and yep. a lot of the topics that I'll try and get across in um, COP28 later this year. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, it, I think this is the thing, isn't it? Like not all not all carbon offsets are equal um, ac across any level. And so um, is, is there any thoughts around regulation or legislation around tightening up? The, you know, like I say, because we, we, we could make a claim on our website that we are, you know, carbon positive and that could just be like i say on our scope one emissions which are zero um and we i go and plant one tree in the local reserve and i don't really know whether that tree survives more than me putting it in the ground but i can still i can make that claim and no one other than maybe a really really savvy consumer who might ring me and say hey tell me about how you did it but beyond you know most people i would suggest don't have time to ring most companies to ask them yeah. actually how are you doing this so yes i mean is there regulation or is that something that you'd want to have or do you think the, the sort of the less good players will just be found out over time with the results it's heavily unregulated um i mean the the standards are far too low for acceptance of carbon credits in most uh in most standards and that's you know that's what i've been lobbying at cop 26 and cop 27 they, there is some tightening going on um, and some attention being brought to this as well as some um, at, a, at an intergovernmental level, level for COP, for example, um, they made a rule not to recognise credits from pre-2013 vintage, um, which, you know, the additionality really comes into question if you're trying to sell 10-year-old credits plus. Mm. Um for something that's already happened and you can't really argue anymore that that will only happen if you get the funding because it, the horse is bolted. Um, I I do see it as being um, the largest players called out by the volume of consumers. You know, you'll get one in, one in 10,000 might be that whistleblower, but the chance yep. of that one in 10,000 shopping with a smaller local store is pretty slim. Yep. And so the chance of a smaller um, operator being called out for greenwashing is very low. Which is unfortunate. Yep. Yep. No. Totally agree. Um, I did hear a few years ago, I was working with a with a mate, um, Jay Scott, and he we, we were trying to wrangle some people together to, to try and plant as many trees as we could. And um, yeah, it was it was a, a really interesting project. We were trying to get off the ground and we were trying to get some investors, or kind of almost like trying to create opportunities for, for for tree planting as part of carbon offsetting but more it, more so it was around look let's just plant some trees um and one thing we were told at that time <clears throat> and whether this is still true or whether it was never true um theoretically planting trees on the equator is better than anywhere else because of the the amount of growth that the tree has and the types of trees was that or was that complete bro science that we were told um, no, it's it's quickest to reach maturity right. at the equator. But and, and this is another thing that we've got to consider long term when you look at, you know, the Cody tree that can offset for a thousand years plus. Mm. And you build the mycorrhizae in the soil in the soil and and that's soil integrity and you get a, a healthy ecosystem that continues even when those trees reach maturity to uh to offset. Planting around the equator, um does does have strong advantages because it's you know the sunlight hours the warmth yep. and um and so on um is is good but but you do reach it's just a steeper growth curve right um more than more than anything um right. you know so kind of, of it's sucking more carbon more quickly in the early piece but 
like you say, you've got to look at the long term. You know, is it? I mean, I guess, yeah, because I'm originally from the UK and you kind of, you know, there's some trees, oak trees that have been there for close to a thousand years, you know. Yeah. If you, and well, clearly that's, yes, its growth might have not been as quick, but it's it's been here for a long time and it's pretty, they're pretty stable, sturdy trees. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't envy your job trying to work out. Like it's, I get, and I guess it's different in different parts of the world, like optimal. Yeah, and, and like I say, with all the social and, stuff, consideration and yeah, you try and plant in an alpine environment, you might never really uh, capitalize on the carbon footprint to go and plant those plants. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the just getting you, them there. Yeah. By the time you've driven up there and they grow so slowly, you know, but yeah, um, but in in, in most um, subtropical areas as well, it's fantastic um fantastic growth if, if um if it's you know new zealand latitude upwards um yes there are advantages to uh, species that grow quickly like mangroves but that's you know you've got to balance out short and long term mm. prospects as well and so i'm just i'm just sort of generally curious so would, would it be better because there's a, there's an element around you know, using wood as a material in general, you know, historically it seemed to be that, you know, you'd, you'd grow a tree, the tree would get to maturity, we'd chop the tree down, we'd use it for our tables, our chairs, for our buildings. But as long as you're planting another tree, you know, you're, you're getting that sustainable benefit of a young tree growing quickly, harvesting it, making use of it for a product that will ultimately fail, but then it's replacing by the next tree. Yes. Does that, is that yeah, is that, is that kind of what we should be thinking about? Or is it actually we want this tree to be here for a thousand years and, and kind of almost like utilisation rate of, of a tree? Is it better to have, uh, but again, it, I guess it's complicated. But yeah, should we should we be making more use of timber and wood as a raw material that's ethically and sustainably farmed in a manner that keeps a high growth of tree that's sequestering as much carbon as possible? Yeah, so it's it's fairly carbon neutral in the process. So by the time you've milled it and by the, shipped it and, and used it for building and so on, it um, you know, the carbon that's embedded in the wood has been mm. well and truly expended during the yep. process. But it's it's still a, 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 a low carbon way to do things. So I'm not saying pine is is terrible. It's it's a great building product. Um it's quick to grow and it's um it, it, it's a it's a good material to work with. The challenge is using it for carbon offsetting. So, yep. you know, fit for purpose. Um, that's where we would we would suggest the. And the other thing with pine, of course, is that it if you're using pine to substitute the logging of uh, native timbers, for example, where you've got a a great ecological balance um, that's sequestering carbon. You've got good soil sequestration going on. Mm you know people need to live and build things you can only do that a certain number of ways and yep. all of those ways have a carbon footprint so yeah um that's the challenge that we have with population growth i guess um mm, it's complicated pine is pine is <laughs> the lesser of many evils in yep. uh, in many ways for building unless when it comes to effort versus cost versus social impact and and environmental impact yeah and that's i think that's increasingly the challenge isn't it it's it's not just recognizing the impact of the one thing that you think you've recognized it's trying to look at that ripple effect and and provide that depth and perspective and unintended consequences and really trying to work out and that's that's quite hard to do that um yeah you've got to take a high level <laughs> pragmatic approach and and make it um palatable for people you've got to make it practical for people to participate in if you build the gap too far and say we've all got to live in earth homes and we've all got to you know or straw bale homes, yeah, um, the level of expertise and and shift would be just too great a leap for everybody to make, yeah, um, yeah, and and you'd end up but, going backwards, yeah. Although possibly less leaky than some houses built in Auckland. Well, oh, I'm not <laughs> saying all the yeah, I'm not saying all the buildings that have been, been done properly. You know, we've yeah. we've had a, a shocking uh, building industry from a a sustainability perspective but yeah. um even the way that cement is produced in new zealand yeah. you know there's all sorts of opportunities for improvement yeah yeah no i was talking about that i had breakfast with a couple of mates this morning and, and we were just talking about that how when the building code was was first introduced 
th- there was no consideration that you know Fongare in the far north is tropical and you can watch everything just rot in your wardrobe down to Gore or Invercargill where you know in the winter you're consistently getting minus temperatures and how it was just kind of like yeah we'll just kind of go with one code because it just seems easier um yeah i think that's i mean that, that's kind of humanity though to a degree isn't it we, we we take the path of least resistance normally because do you know it's it's the the easy wrong versus the hard right decision it's we're we're yeah humans discuss sometimes it, it amazes me we've lasted this long sometimes um yeah yeah but um so so young dave growing up you, you grew up in auckland yeah, I grew up out in the Waitakere's, um, uh, out in the bush, really, um, yeah. with a mother who was a naturopath and a father who was a merchant banker, so I had, had sort of polar opposite parents. That's that's quite a mix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I had a good business um, business influence, and I also had, you know, we are running around bare feet at school and <laughs> on an <laughs> organic-only type of diet. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah sort of young Dave did you did you kind of have a feeling growing up that you would end up doing something like what you're doing or was there a different path that you'd sort of identify yeah because like I say you got different tensions there you know was sort of but you, I mean maybe you've, you've got the perfect balance because you seem to have got that financial now you've got that business side of you but you're doing it in a manner that's you know holistic and taking care of the planet so yeah was that always the path you kind of felt you're going to be on or or yeah how, no how did it you wasn't end up? it wasn't always I sort of fell fell into it out of necessity because I saw too many problems with the way business was done um and I first noticed that when I went to you know our high school and I oh, actually no it was earlier than that I went to on a primary school visit to the rubbish tip and mm. you know, we didn't have rubbish collection um where we lived so yeah. we had take things down to the refuse center and recycling center um so when my parents went shopping they would deliberately not buy things that had plastics because you know we couldn't burn it in the fire and yep um and so on so from that early stage you know we grew a lot of our own things um we we're buying you know flour and 10 kg or 5 kg yep. sacks and things. it was it was all very low waste for the amount of food produced and Yep. and um that we lived off when i went into um high school in particular and, and intermediate sort of more towards i call it the big smoke but titarangi which was <laughs> I don't know, on the fringe of the bush yeah um and it, you know everybody's bringing chips in these multi-packs and there's yeah. like three chips per bag and yep. it, it, more more plastic than there was food in the plastic and mm. you know stuff blowing around everywhere and and we'd been to a visit to the tip and I'd seen you know the stream just on the way as we're walking to the tip looking down the bridge and there's disposable nappies and oil you know uh, all yeah. over the surface of the water and then I was just thinking that is disgusting how and then how do we generate so much waste and people just have no idea um they put everything in a bin and it just vanishes and they yeah. think it's gone for good and it's no longer a problem um so we we have no discouragement to generate shitloads of waste, as you know. Certainly in New Zealand, I'm not sure what the rest of the world is like, but uh, unless we start really charging by you know by weight and volumetric weight and and toxicity weight or whatever mm. of, of rubbish, we we we'll, we won't be driven to change our behaviours. And that was at an early stage where I sort of was in shock and started talking to my own social circle like yeah, do you guys not realize what happens with this stuff like mm. uh, this is if, if a four million people five million people behave like this can you imagine what it's going to be like in 20 years time like this we're going to run out of room to walk because everything's going to be landfill um it, that sort of concept which started to catch on with some of my friends and I found I was able to have a bit of influence there and I thought you know this is this is cool and but we really need businesses to adopt this yep. sort of shift and I got into business out of um I guess being entrepreneurial but always those values with every business I got into those values remained strong I never understood carbon so some of those you know businesses I was flying around in helicopters and jets and things and without really knowing damage that I was doing I thought 
trees loved carbon dioxide. So back then I thought I was, you know, as long as they were running clean. <laughs> Do them a favour. Yeah, that was yeah. a big thing. I was a big advocate for anti-air pollution uh, issues, which is, you know, the nitrous oxides um, yeah. and particulates and so on. So I did lots of lobbying for that. But clean CO2, I never realised, was actually the invisible enemy. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, as as we grow and learn and mature, we realise yep. what, what we thought uh, was behaving well is, is actually not necessarily the case. And, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, learning about methane as well was another thing I thought, you know, organic farming was probably good because it's all, it all seems natural and, you know, the cows naturally fertilize the soil and so on, but I didn't realize it was probably not quite as good as I thought it, it was back, back in the early days. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't, you don't know what you don't know, do you? And no, no. Um, <laughs> until you go on a bit of a journey of discovery or you start going down some rabbit holes. Um, yeah. You, you, you don't know until, until you do. Um, so yeah, so it, sounds, it kind of sounds like you've had, always had that sort of sense of values and and wanting to do the right thing. It's just always interesting because some people, and probably myself included, like I, I probably wasn't very connected to. Well, I mean, I, I was in, interested in the outdoors growing up. Um, we do lots of hiking. Um, it's sort of in Wales um, and a bit in Scotland and stuff in the holidays with my dad. Um, but yeah, not having didn't really have that real sense of social and environmental connection and wanting to do good. It, yeah, for me it was it was much more of a early midlife crisis kind of massive shift in in me. So it's just always interesting to find out from other B corps that like have you been always been this way or have you have you come to this realization at a later point or at some point in life? I guess um, lots of mini realizations along the way. You know, yeah. where I think I'm doing good and then I realize ah, oh, yep, <laughs> actually no no I've really stuffed up. Um, yep. <laughs> there's plenty of those moments in my life <laughs> yeah and so when did um b corp as an idea pop up on the radar was that just at carbon click or had you heard of it before you started carbon click no it was it was actually it was actually getting into carbon click that i started looking at how do we uh audit for robustness how do we prove our credentials are um a, a cut above the others entering the industry how do we prove that we're genuine when we can see a lot of competitors are not? And I came across B Corp um, as, as as I was researching a number of different standards and found that, you know, that seemed to be the gold standard in um, challenging a business to do better. And that's what I really resonated with. It wasn't just a stamp that said, yeah, we're good, a pat on the back, but it was a process that we could go through that really challenge us to search deep and see what we could do better as well as you know giving a stamp that that would add credibility to the business yeah no 100 percent. it's said it a hundred times it's definitely not a, a pay-to-play certification framework or or a club where you just pay some money and you get to put a logo and say hey we're kind of thinking about doing some good but please don't ask us what we're actually doing um yeah rigorous but achievable is how i like to describe it um because i think uh jamie oliver from his uh, uh restaurant group in the uk who got b corp a few years ago he described it as like having the tax man have a good rifle around your knicker drawer um sort of in terms of how deep the the process goes um yeah so you sort of highlights anything yeah anything unexpected good or bad that that came out from going through the b corp journey um because i think because you scored pretty well i seem to remember i think you were yeah we had some good help <laughs> maybe yeah you might have had a guy um but i mean you you were clearly a b corp because it's again you know when we, when we work with companies some companies are, are new to the idea of business for good and purpose and impact and you, you, we we are kind of a part of their transition journey to, to get them over the edge to go okay right we, we're now in the world of b corp um but carbon click like you were clearly a b corp from day one like just how you were what, what you're doing and how you're doing it you were clearly a b corp from day one yeah so was there anything anything from within the assessment or any changes that you had to make that you can remember? Because it was what, a couple of years ago now, is it? or maybe even more? Yeah, yeah, there were certainly <clears throat> some uh, challenges to our policies um, that we realised we, you know, had internalised, but hadn't, um, hadn't properly communicated to the wider team because we make a lot of assumptions that everybody knows how to do this or everybody knows that this should be how we acted. Um, so 
you know, th that was really helpful for us, for our staff onboarding process as we're bringing new members into the team um, to highlight all of the things that we expect behavior-wise, all of the things that we can help them with on their journey. Um, uh, so, so bringing the impact of, you know, our core leadership team who live and breathe this, breathe this into the wider community that, that work with us, including contractors and so on, um, those were really valuable processes to go through and realize that we actually had made so many assumptions that weren't uh, translating to the action we would expect from everybody in the team. Yeah. Um, so, so that was really good, challenging those standards and having to come up with some of those standards to mm. backfill the gaps when we were asked the questions. Um, the other thing that was really good about it was the B Corp community that um, that were around us. So, so when we uh, when we reach out to others or others reach out to us, knowing that we're both B Corps is um, it, it brings a lot of instant credibility, instant um, uh, being in the same whānau together or family together. Um, uh, feel to it, which I didn't realise was was so strong in the B Corp community. So there's a lot of um, networking. There's, you know, we've hosted a few, uh, sorry, we've hosted one, but attended a number of the B Corp networking events and so on. Nice. And it, yeah, that was that was a lot more than I was expecting. Nice. Yeah, because I guess you guys were in that classic startup phase. It's kind of like, you know, who's this person? I don't know, but do you work? Yeah, you do work here. You know, you've got all of that going on. And so, yeah, we we definitely see that that the startup world using B Corp as a tool to just make sure that, yeah, back, like you say, backfilling the stuff that you think you're doing, but actually who's, is someone actually measuring that? Or are we, are we managing that? Or how, actually, can we just write that down as to how we do that? Because like you say, when I've kind of going through that process myself, I've got a, a team that are working with me now at, at Grow Good and it's, I've been trying to dump the business out of my head into documents and videos and other operational bits so that other people, you know, because in my head, I, I know what I think I, I want to be doing. Um, yeah. So it's quite a useful process having, having the B Corp framework just to think about, okay, yeah, well, how are we going to onboard a new employee and what do they need to know about how we operate and why do we do this and, you know, carbon 101 and, and what have you. So I know that's cool. Yeah. Um, what, any sort of challenges or hurdles for you guys? Like I said, I think you you were pretty B Corp aligned. Um, so probably no no massive fundamental shifts in how you did stuff perhaps, or was there? No, a... no nothing fundamental. Um, but the challenge that we had was the timing. Um, was we really uh, underestimated how long it would take to process everything. Um, so... That was really difficult from our perspective is keeping the inertia going. You get your head into the program and then you wait months for feedback. And then by the time the feedback came, you sort of had to try and remember where everything was at again. <laughs> yeah. Kind of re, re familiarize yourself with everything yep. again, um, or the application again to resubmit yep. it. So it was, that was a really difficult process um, from the from the time delays and the yeah. amount of disconnect and, and rework that goes on. Yeah. And I guess stuff like particularly, that. particularly being a startup where actually the business might have changed significantly over two months. Like actually we, we don't do, we don't do that anymore. We're growing quickly, <laughs> you know, bringing team members on quickly. We're in yeah. different, you know, every time we went back, the application needed to change um, because of yeah. the time delays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're definitely getting better at that. Um, it feels like, yeah, I think if I sort of remember when you guys were going through the certification, the verification phase, that was like the beginning of the acceleration of the busyness, whereas now it does seem to be coming down a bit. So, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Bad, bad timing for you, maybe. Um, but, yeah. And so um, so now what does what does being a B Corp mean to you on the sort of the day to day as a, as a CEO of a fast growing company that's, you know, doing some good in the world? Yeah, so what it means to us is um, stopping and taking a step back every single day at where we're going, the deals that we've got on, what um, uh, what we're developing, and and saying, and the people that we've got doing it, and saying, look, is there a way that we can do things uh, more impactfully here? Is there a way that we can engage somebody better here? 
um, outside the organisation or influence somebody outside the organisation to adopt these values? Is there someone that we're working with that we think should be put through the B Corp process, you know, particularly customers that are wanting to offset, but they're too early in the sustainability journey, for example. So on a daily basis, we're sort of thinking very actively about um, who we're working with from a consumer perspective and what we're doing from an impact perspective and whether we can improve on that. And that that also is, I guess, core to our principles of how we select carbon offset projects when we're auditing them. The B Corp values are really adopted into our audit methodology. Nice. That's super cool. Yeah, because I, there is the risk is that B Corp is it's just a certificate that sits on your wall and it doesn't get integrated. And it, it, it yeah, it clearly you've made, um, yeah, really good use of that. Um, I guess w one question really keen to get your insights on. So you are a fast growing startup, you know, a money hungry is typically what startups are. Um, you're typically on the lookout for more cash, uh, to keep the runway going and, you know, build and, and get the product to the next level, keep your customer experience going and, and what have you. So do, do you feel that there's a tension between doing good and making money um, for you? And I think you're, you're quite similar to sort of Jamie from Twice Cups, you know, start startup business, B Corp, trying to balance purpose and profit. He's got the bonus that he's a family owned business. So it's him and his mum and dad and wife with a young kid in the business. So they've got an extra layer of pressure on that one. Um, but yes, yeah, so how, how do you find balancing the money side of the the, 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 the business and, and maintaining doing good? I, I find that quite easy. Um, we've got investors that are well aligned and as long as there are profits that are sustainable as well as, you know, as long as the business models work, um, and, you know, there are a few basic rules to business models. Um, if we step outside them, it doesn't work. Um, and then it becomes a charity. So as long as mm. in a charity, it's very difficult to get investment for unless you're WWF. In fact, it's even difficult for yep. <laughs> people like that to get investment for um, donations. But um, we, we certainly have to make sure that we follow the business sustainability rules from a financial sustainability perspective. and that can involve some tough decisions, you know, poor performers have to be weeded out of the team and so on, um, unfortunately. But that's, you know, generally speaking, um, the fact that whenever we're making profits, we're making significant impact because it's directly tied to the number of customers that we've got, the volume of carbon yeah. offsetting flowing through the platform and so on. Um, we, we can take care of both at the same time, but it does involve some tough decisions. You know, sometimes people are going through tough things, um, tough periods of their life where they've got maybe repeated, repeated illnesses and things like that, where we've mm. had to say, look, we, we can't uh, at this stage in our journey afford to support them. Um, otherwise we're going to be unsustainable ourselves as yep. a business. We're going to have to, you know, refer you out so that you can go on a sickness benefit or something like that and yep. just stop working for us. Um, those are those are the tough calls that I hate making. Mm. Um, but at the same time, if I didn't, we wouldn't get investment. We wouldn't be able to continue scaling at the rate that we are, and yep. we wouldn't have the wider impact that we're having. So it's a case of balancing what are the tough decisions that we have to make with the resources that we've got to um, to be able to generate the maximum impact we can for the planet. Yep. Yeah, I think that's that's really cool. Um, that the fo the focus on the impact is is kind of the key thing I think, which helps you make those tougher decisions. It's yeah. Whereas, yeah, it's maybe having come from a background of being in more money driven enterprises, where it's like actually we we don't really care about the impact. It's it's literally. I mean, it makes it easy to make decisions when it's just about the bottom line. Um, but typically, those decisions lead to worse long term outcomes for people and planet. Whereas I guess you've got that real clear lens and focus on the environmental and social outcomes that you're trying to create, which you are creating. And so, yeah, it's kind of, I guess, yeah, you just need to put your lens more towards the the impact side of it. Yeah. Also balancing out social impact on one person versus how many people are going to benefit socially um, from this project. From this project. If, yeah. You know, if we have that money redirected instead of supporting yeah. somebody 
really there are in New Zealand in particular, we've got good government support able to to step in yeah. in difficult times. So yeah, a little easier discuss, decision here in New Zealand the, than it would be the if US. We're in the yeah exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not looking forward to being faced with some of those decisions again in the future. Yeah. And so plans for, for the, for the business, you, you, you're going big. Um, what's, yeah, where, where are you at? What are the plans for the, for the next little while? Yeah. So the plans for the next little while are to um, continue. I mean, 90% of our business is offshore as it is. So it's sort of a global from day one uh, kind of setup. But the plans now are unlocking what we call a Series A investment round um, to bring on more funding for the business, to bring on uh, an international team, um, sales and partner management team, really. We've got great partnerships in place from SAP to um, AWS and so on that will leverage us into their customer base. But we really need uh, humans on board to drive that partner partnership channel. Um, yep. and that's that's expensive. Um, so we've you know we've set up our US and uh, UK um, companies and uh, in the process of Singapore and Abu Dhabi as well, so that we can sort of base base our uh, soldiers on the ground, so to speak. Yep. In the markets that we're expanding out of strategically. Nice. And that'll. That'll see us, you know, there are spaces like the event space, for example, that we're yeah. going into in a big way over the next 18 months, um, yep. leveraging uh, organisations like Formula One and FIFA that we've been very lucky to win those big contracts. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for those opportunities um, for a little New Zealand tech startup um, to be out, out competing much bigger uh, incumbents that were that we yep. were against in the tender process nice and do you think that's coming back to your methodology like how, how you're doing it do you think that's, or what, what, that's what else is that's there? certainly yeah that's certainly a part of it there's there are a few different aspects there's the geopolitical nature um new zealand is a, a good geopolitically neutral country as yep. far as the rest of the world goes so do not seem to be supporting yep. their com competing countries um yep. so that's yep. That's a small advantage, but the main thing is, yeah, the the robustness of our audit process, the genuineness of the the whole team and the organisation comes mm. through from everybody that uh, interacts with a carbon quick team member. Yeah, um, that's that's a common comment. Um, but the software itself, the platform that we've got, the end to end engagement that it takes consumers on the journey of, as well as the businesses on the journey of, that yep. that is really the key um yeah, building sort of a great, a great product yeah yeah well it's the, it's the only platform that has some traceability track and trace so that you can see your donation has actually been accounted for on the registry where that carbon offset project is is nice. registered so you know you know you know exactly what component of your money reaches the end project after yeah. any transaction fees and, and so on yeah super cool and does um has b corp come up uh, in terms of like mentions in dispatches when you've uh when you've won a tender or has that yeah has that led to any opportunities it's certainly enhanced and wrapped some robustness around um uh, around who we are it's some yep. external validation and it's it's much um it's actually much more cost effective than the other validation processes that we were looking at through mm. you know um customized audit processes with one of the big four uh, yep. accounting firms and so on yep. um so from our perspective it was a great balance because it brings in a lot more actual improvement to the business uh, yep. if i make think about things um as well as it being a you know we repurposed really our budget that we were going to put into just a compliance type um stamp and i think that yep. we needed something for yep. winning those big contracts and, and b corp has satisfied that nice super cool so the future looks pretty exciting for you guys. Um, thoughts on yeah the future of B Corp? Where, where do you think in ten years time? What does what does B Corp mean to people? What does it yeah What does the movement look like in your in your eyes? Yeah, so I mean I see B Corp as being the uh, the standard, the upper um, upper echelon of of standards that organisations aren't just doing the bare minimum for social license. If they're B Corp certified, they're actually organisations that are not only have reached a certain standard, but 
are continuously pushing the boat out as far as what else is possible, what else could we do. Um, I think that continuous improvement will be a really important factor as, as far as credibility for B Corp goes. You don't just sit and forget and say, yeah, we're good. Um, because new technology, new products, new uh, ways of thinking come uh, come to come to light that need to continuously be embedded if you really want to be in those um, top environmental and social performers globally. Um, so I I would say it's really important to have the continuous improvement standards. You should reach a higher score every time you go for your recertification, for example. And if you don't reach a higher score, there should be some questions asked. Um, that I think those those kind of things would be really important. The new standards um, look more comprehensive, and I'm hoping that, or the new draft standards rather, I'm hoping that that will be able to be maybe broken down into two steps so that small organisations can still participate without yeah. the resources that may be needed for the B Corp certification under the new draft framework. Yeah, um, we certainly don't want to see good-minded organisations not going through the B Corp process because it's too expensive or too cumbersome. Yeah, um, but certainly, you know, based on revenue or volume uh, or size, it, it would be good. The draft standards that are coming out look like they'll really um, address taking enterprises to the next level. Yeah, uh, and in yep. accountability. Um, which which is a good thing. So hopefully hopefully it can be split into a couple of um, yeah. approachable versus uh, high compliance fit for purpose for the organization size so that it's not just a big boys game. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see how where it lands. Um yeah, like I said, I, I think I that's my kind of fear is that, that yeah, does it become overly cumbersome and um does it restrict the mid the middle the middle ground business that could sneak in to be a B Corp currently, um, who would then be on a journey of discovery and improvement, whereas they might just go, oh, this is way too hard, so we're just we're not going to bother. And I think at the at where the movement is at globally, we're just on that, you know, we're just sort of hitting the the real growth phase. It would seem silly to sort of chop that <laughs> step yeah. halfway and then reset it and make it harder again. Um, yeah, yeah. The world needs a standard like B Corp that's on, you know, ten percent of products, ten percent yes. of businesses. That yeah, um, to get that critical so mass. Know that that's the top ten percent, and that gives you plenty of selection because yeah. you know, got ten products to choose from. One of them will be a B Corp product. Um, yeah. that's where it needs to get, and then people can become or consumers can become creatures of habit of knowing which products that they're going to switch to. Um, yeah, I think it's. It doesn't have that critical mass that would be exciting to see. Yeah, we're getting there. It definitely feels like you go around the supermarket now, there's quite a few more options with a little B logo on it compared to even two to three years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's like a, the options vegetarians had 10 years ago versus now <laughs> and vegans yeah. especially. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's getting there. It's, on, it's, it's, getting it's there. on the right journey. Cool. Well, um, yeah, that was super cool. It was really good to know to get to know you a bit more and get to understand the depth that you've got behind Carbon Click. Um, yeah, just a super cool business. You're super cool humans doing some really good stuff. So um, keep up your Likewise. great work, I suppose. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing seeing you get some money. If I had some money for a Series A Series A fundraise, I'd, I'd give you some, but I don't. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have a look, I'm gonna have a look behind the sofa. <laughs> Might find a couple of dollars. Um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> All the best with that. If, if anyone's listening in and, and, and wants to get hold of you, we'll, we'll put your details down if you've got a couple of mil lying around for Dave to uh, help him grow his business. How, how much are you allowed to say? How much are you looking for? Or is that confidential? Yeah, we're, we're going to do a, a 10 mil US uh, raise, which carries through about a three-year sales cycle because yep. you're dealing with organisations like airlines and and, yep. and large. Yeah, tech. yeah. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come, we'll come back to you cycle. next year. Yeah. yeah, the sales cycle can be a solid 12, 12 months. So we want to yeah. fully capitalize on that by the time we're ready for the next scale up raise. Yeah. So um, you think it'll be multiple investors or do you oh, yes, think there's yes, absolutely. Yeah, not, not looking yeah, for one person? Of, yep. Yep. No, it'll be a team of uh, 10 to 20, um, each, yep. each that bring their own strategic yep. strength for the business that we can leverage as well to help us. Nice. Scale. Nice.
Oh, well, yeah, all the best for the fundraise. Let us know. Oh, no doubt we'll see on social media when you're popping champagne corks to uh, to celebrate that milestone. But yeah, no, really great to catch up, Dave. And um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing, mate. Love it. Hey, it's Tim here, that B Corp bloke from Grow Good. If you want more content on purpose, B Corp, how to do more good in the world as an individual or a business, then you know the drill. Hit the like and subscribe. Check out some of my other videos. They're probably floating around here somewhere. You know how it works. Thank you so much. See you next time.